Hello everybody, this is GM Jesse Cry, and it's my pleasure today to bring you Game 1 of the World Championship Match 2010 between Topolov and Anand. And uh, Game 1 was a humiliating defeat by uh, Topolov over Anand, and Anand, we'll see, makes a psychological mistake of some kind uh, early in the game. And, and really, this game is a test of nerves and a test of preparation at the beginning of the match. So let's get into it. Um, we get this Grunfeld. Now, many were asking themselves what Anand would choose, and he chooses the Grunfeld. This is, of course, what Komsky also played against Anand in their match. And Komsky really had little problems with the opening. And everyone was saying, you know, that Komsky was going to have problems in the opening, if anything at all, because Topolov is known for his evil opening preparation. It really wasn't the problem of the opening. So, one thing we're gonna, we saw in this game one was that both players played incredibly fast, and at first it just seemed ridiculous. But then in hindsight, it becomes clear that Anand had prepared specifically for this line that we're going to see that Topolov uses, and um, knew it kind of inside and out, and Topolov, you know, probably suspected that this was one of the defenses that Anand would throw at him. So here we go. E4, knight c3, bc, bishop g7. Now, of course, there's many moves here. Uh, you got the knight f3, rook b1 line, all kinds of different moves. Uh, Topolov plays bishop c4, which really suits his style, because the idea is that white's going to try to aim for an attacking position here. Um, and by putting the bishop here, obviously, we're going to get some scope on the king. And the knight on e2 isn't going to be subjected to a pin with bishop g4 later. So here we go, c5, knight e2, knight c6, bishop e3. This has all been played a million times before, and uh, I played this myself when I was a kid with this variation of white. Castles, castles. Now, this is a topical position, been played many, many times. And um, the kind of standard moves here are bishop g4 and queen c7. Now, the deal with bishop g4... Um, is that in this position here, knight a5, basically after about a hundred games in Kasparov-Karpov matches back in the day, it was basically decided that this extra pawn of whites on g4 is nothing at all. Not so special. Black's got fine play. But they played it on and on because the Russians really like their pawns. And that was a big debate for many years. But I don't think that was what Anand was worried about. I think Anand was concerned, bishop e6. Now here rook c1 is a move, but I think he was concerned with this move, d5. Now it's a very tricky business because really I, I feel like this position should nevertheless just be equal for black. Black should be fine here. Um, typical is this position, and many games have been played here. But the, the problem is, even though objectively he's fine, I think Anand felt he was giving Topolov the kind of game he wanted, and also a position which he surely studied in a lot of depth. And, and one mistake here by Black could really be the end. So that's why I think Topolov played, uh, or excuse me, Anand played the variation that he did, which is a variation that um, has been used by Komsky, and before that by Svidler. First we hit the bishop, and then just patiently play b6. Excuse me, I, I'm, I'm totally messing up here, of course, with the bishop hanging on g4. Knight a5, bishop d3, b6. And like I said, this was first used by Svidler, and then later by uh, Komsky in the match with Topolov that I mentioned before. So, um, well, first of all, taking on c5 is generally a bad thing for white um, because if he takes say now even probably bishop e6 and black is controlling c4 and has a nice game um, one idea for white is to play rook c1 with the intention of next move taking on c5 so that after bishop e6 he can play c4 and maybe we'll see rook c1 um, later in the match but queen d2 is in fact the move that Topolov also played against Komsky. And Komsky, as well as Anand, 
both played e5 here. This is a very um, aggressive way of dealing with this position. And it's a very nice positional idea because if white pushes past, <clears throat> black has a simple plan of putting the knight onto d6. And from d6, it will be very difficult for white to make any progress. And that's been shown in a couple of games. Um, so d5, not the best try for white here. And Topolov plays what he did against Komsky, bishop h6. So this helps explain why the moves were played so fast, even coming up here. We're still, the players are still playing ridiculously fast, as if they were children in a scholastic tournament. That's how fast they were playing. So pawn takes, bishop takes, king takes, pawn takes, pawn takes. Now, here um, is the first divergence from the Komsky game. In, in the Topolov Komsky, f4 was played, which is definitely the most natural looking move. White has to, of course, attack. And um, there we saw f6, e5, bishop d7, which is a very strange looking move, but it turned out that black was in fact simply just fine after this move. And in that game, Komsky at some point was even much better. You know, this position is essentially not dangerous for black. So, Topolov played the natural looking rook c1, which is an obvious alternative. And here, you know, we're going to see uh, several moves where both players really have um, choices, but they were still playing very fast. Um, and I like Anand's idea here. He plays queen d6. Now, other another move that had been played um, before was bishop b7. I believe that was Karyakin Carlson, and I give that game in the notes. And uh, definitely playable. That game went f4, rook c8, rook takes, queen takes, and then, you know, there's some scariness happening after f5. And one of the questions is, for black, where does he want the bishop? Okay. And we're going to see that it ends up becoming a huge problem for black that he doesn't immediately develop the bishop. In general, if black can trade off some rooks, and the heavies in particular, the king position, which is black's major problem here, isn't going to be such a big deal. So the plan that Anand uses, queen d6, as far as I can tell, has three, diff three ideas in mind. One, the queen wants to centralize itself, and by centralizing itself, prevent white from uh, attacking. Two, it's going to try to restrain the f4 and e4 pawns. And three, we're, we're being undecided yet as to where the bishop wants to go, if it wants to go to d7 or b7. So we're keeping white guessing for a moment of how things are going to develop with the bishop. But notice, at the moment, there's a real strategical problem with bishop c8, knight a5, and rook a8, and that they're not actually yet working. But still, black has not made any kind of mistake yet. f4, f6, this is the idea. Obviously, if you put the queen on d6, it wouldn't make a lot of sense for white to hit you, allow white to hit you with tempo, with e5. So now, f5 is played. Now, um, again, Anand plays very quickly, queen e5, which is a great move, and we'll talk a little bit about why that's a nice move. But notice, too, that the, the beginnings of the downfall are also being laid. Bishop c8, knight a5, rook a8 aren't playing, and also the queen's doing so much in this position that she might become overworked. She's guarding c7, she's guarding d4, she's clearly guarding f6, and she's guarding a lot of other squares around the king. So, uh, a fine move. Now let's talk about why uh, maybe Anon did it. So, on bishop d7, okay, there's some questions with uh, 
knight f4. And there's this really tricky business that if black now pushes g5, which looks natural to force the knight to make a decision, white has this tricky looking 96. Now I'm going to show a computer line here, but I don't think it's inappropriate to show the computer line right here because these players will have studied this at length with their computers running. Bishop takes e5. Now notice, with the queen on e5, this kind of trick is impossible. Queen e5, of course, if fe, then the pawn on g5 hangs. Rook fe1, and the queen doesn't really have any great squares. If queen d5 were later going to have uh, rook c7 available after fe6, I get that variation in the notes. And after, say, queen d6, rook e6, queen d7, so like h4, white has a very promising initiative. So that trick, I think, is part of the basis for black to play e5, queen e5, right now. And indeed, the queen looks very nice there. And I, I, I definitely think black's doing fine. Now, knight f4 is played. And one of the reasons I think they're playing so fast is, you know, moves like knight f4, it's, it's kind of hard to recommend another plan for, uh, for, for white. Now here, Anand very quickly plays his next move, g5. But the move bishop d7 was also probably just eminently playable. The main question, though, would be bishop c4. What's going on after bishop c4? And um, I give that variation in the notes. It's probably also equal. Okay? So, g5, I think, is a fine move. Knight h5. And here, again... And none plays very quickly, but I feel like this was a big chance to improve. Also, just aesthetically, I don't like uh, Anand's move here. Let's look at it first before I talk about what I think he should have done. He played king g8, and the idea is to say that after h4, black's simply going to play h6 and is going to be fine. And that, that might even be true. Um... But to, to me, the king is funny here on g8. It's on this diagonal. And if I could, I'd rather not make moves like h6. So during the game, my intuitive reaction to this was king h8. And the idea is to meet h4 with rook g8. And it's hard to imagine what else black can do besides playing h4 in order, you know, in terms of a plan that can increase his initiative. And with rook g8, we're really uh, asking also who's attacking who by getting that rook into not only, you know, some play on the g5, but also, you know, if the rook comes to g5, the rook will very much help on the defense. So I thought this was, even though, you know, they're still in prep and it's a little bit strange to criticize Anand for moves that are clearly in his prep, uh, I felt king g8 was a funny move. Now, one thing, just to, let's talk positionally for a moment here. Um, white's pieces, as well as black's, black's pieces are clearly, in some sense, dubious. It's clear that the knight on a5 wants to come back into the game, and the bishop c8 has to do something to let rook a8 in. But white's pieces are a little bit strange here, too. Notice that with these pawns on f5 and e4, the bishop on d3 isn't really participating in the game. And what queen e5 is doing by preventing e5 from moving is to a large extent aimed at just controlling that bishop from doing anything important. Now, the same thing can be said about knight h5. The knight on h5 is at the edge of the board, and I think we have a situation here that if the knight does not... Uh, well, let me put it this way. If the initiative does not continue upon the black king, black will, white will be in danger of losing because the knight will be off sides. 
And uh, in particular, if black gets a couple moves and gets moves like bishop d7, rook c8, and white isn't able to do anything significant to black, then the knight will be a major problem because it won't be participating in the game. So here, my sense is that white's all in. He has to uh, win this game by some kind of attack. Okay, so clearly h4 is the next move coming, and Anand's plan is as said, h6. The pawns are traded. And now rook f3, played again very relatively quickly. Move 23, you know, and this is a little bit barbaric uh, to be playing so fast. The move rook f3 is also barbaric, it has a very barbaric intention. The intention is simply to play rook g3, and knight f6, sacking and crashing through. And perhaps due to this situation, uh, Anand loses his mind here. There's no other way to say it. He loses his mind. He, he plays a move which clearly is a move, kind of move that only a computer would play, suggesting that this is some kind of theme that he had seen with his computer. Let's talk about the move just to put it there on the table. He played king f7 which is a really disgusting move from an aesthetic point of view. Um, but also I think it is a question of nerves because both players have been rattling it off for so long here that it, you know, it seemed almost like a test of who can do it the longest. Um, and so I think Anand played this move much too quickly thinking he knew uh, what his preparation was, when in fact he didn't. And, and you can imagine with all these variations he's trying to remember in this line that he studied so long that has a lot of different, you know, sidelines, that psychologically he, he's beginning to lose it. Now, um, let's look at bishop d7 and rook g3. Now I think perhaps here white could think about, or black could think about king f7, and, and maybe you know, his, this is what, you know, the computer told him to do. Uh, it's some kind of similar situation, but that's also a little bit hard to believe, because here the computer wants to play the kind of very computer-like move, rook c8, excuse me, rook c8. And I say computer-like because you're allowing white really to achieve what looks like too much with knight f6, queen f6, rook g5, king f7. It turns out, however, that um, if anyone's better here, it's actually black, which to human perspective is ridiculous because it looks like white has more than enough compensation now with uh, e5 in particular looming. If white could somehow achieve e5, uh, the game would be over. Now, I gave some variations in the, um, in the file if you want to take a look, but basically the computer's saying black's okay here and... Uh, you know, this is obviously, this is in a sense important because in later rounds, uh, this could, some kind of thing like this could be considered. Though honestly, I think Black's big improvement is to play King H8 earlier. Because this, to me, even even though the computer says Black is, you know, doing better here, is, is a little bit ridiculous because it's so, so frightening. In any case, um, when you think about the position just logically, Bishop d7 is, is clearly the move you want to play, right? You want to play rook c8 as quickly as possible. So the move king f7 uh, is just kind of disgusting because not only is the king not necessarily um, safer there, but he hasn't solved the problem of knight a5, bishop c8, rook a8. And now notice, just thematically here, when we think about the position, due to the problem of those three pieces, the queen on e5 is really being asked to do a lot of work. She's being asked to cover c7, d4, f6, like we said, and because of that, it's really, in a lot of ways, black's only good piece. So, that'll help us understand how Topola found the next move, which uh, the computer doesn't actually find at least immediately. And that move is the very nice knight takes f6. And I'm, I feel certain that this move will go down in history as, as you know one of those moves that you see in combination books that we talk about in chess history. 
because it's a very nice body blow that just completely wrecks the black position. Now, Topolov played king f6, and some people suggested that queen f6 would have been a better try. So let's take a look at that. Queen f6. Now, the computer, you know, says rook h3 is winning, and it's got all kinds of strange ideas. You know, some people are even saying bishop b5 is winning because uh, the king can't go to e8 when you check on c7. But honestly, my sense here is that Topolov was probably intending the very natural rook c7, and it turns out that even this natural move uh, is also winning. For example, king e8, now we give the natural check, king d8, and now it's not too hard to find this move, rook fc3. And the point is that black really can't move. Uh, he can't move the bishop here because of rook d7. Uh, and he can't really move the knight away because then we'll get the c6 square or the c4 square. c6 hitting the queen, the c4 square hitting the pawn. And notice even that moves like a6, bishop a4, b5 doesn't work because we can just play rook c1 and... Uh, there's a problem with the knight on e5. Notice here, too, the queen on f6 is really overworked, can't move because this pawn on g5 is hanging. Now, that's just one variation of this thing with rook c7 check. Um, but it's the human way to play, and, and I wanted to just emphasize it because a lot of people were saying queen f6 would have been the better practical try, but I'm just pointing out that even after you play humanly with rook c7, the computer wanted something like rook h3, you still have a, a winning game with black's pieces completely tied down. And it's often the case in these middle game situations that if you haven't moved your junk out, knight a5, bishop c8, rook a8, you shouldn't be surprised when you get a situation where nothing can move, be moved at all. So, king f6 was played, now the very strong rook h3. Now, um, Yeah, this this position uh, I looked at at some points. Uh, queen f4 seemed like the first logical attempt for black. And uh, many moves were suggested here as winning. I think there's more than one. Uh, e5 looked very strong. I also liked rook h6. And uh, one point, for example, is king e5. I can take the knight and get this very nice mate. And uh, if king g7, it seemed to me that even the very simple endgame variation like this is winning. Because the, uh, first of all, we're threatening rook h1 mate, so something like rook f7. So this king f3, we take the pawn and we roll the two uh, passers. Now obviously there's probably an easier way than that, but just the fact that we can make chess so easy is already a very positive sign for white. Okay. And queen f4, you know, if you don't have that move, it's it's not surprising that um, you're going to lose. Notice all these moves that black, he can't do any move with his bishop on c8, which will help him. And that's, that's part of the issue here. So in the game, black played rook g8. Check. Now, king f7 was played. And now, a very nice move. Rook h7. I say very nice because there, there's probably other ways, but this makes things fairly simple. And part of the point is rook g7 isn't going to work. Now, some players maybe wouldn't even think about rook h7 too much because they'd be afraid of exchanging off the attacker. But when we look at it, really it's black's rook and queen are the only pieces defending at all. So we get rid of them and keep our initiative going we should expect to win, and that's in fact what happens here. Rook takes. If queen takes rook c7, so king takes queen g5, it's a mess. King f8, queen d8, queen e8, I don't know what else to do, queen d4, and the game's over. The rook's coming to c7. We're going to play things like queen f6. e5, of course, is in the air. Too much. So that allows white to give this check. 
black goes back. If king f6, of course, something like rook c c7 is just humiliatingly strong. And um, now the computer finds bishop b5. Okay, but no need. We play the, the human move rook c c7. And um, this game, it's, it, it's obviously to the point now where, where things have gotten humiliating. King d8, and now a nice move, bishop b5. All of white's pieces are now in play, and black really is having a hard time moving. Um, if the queen takes the bishop, we have queen d4, and that's going to be mate. If queen c7, queen d4, we're also going to see a mate soon. And the rook on g8 can't really move either because the pawn on g5. And that shows itself in a variation like knight b7, bishop c4. Rook can't move. If queen comes to g5, that's the end. So black in this position really can't do much. He played queen e4. And after rook c8, was forced to resign. There were other ways to finish the game, but rook c8 just makes things simple. Uh, if rook takes, then rook d7... Rook d4 wins the queen. And on king takes, we have queen c1, knight c6, bishop c6. Way too much. So, um, an interesting game, which I say interesting because I think it has a lot to do with the pressures of playing in a big match like this and the kind of weird psychological state players get when they come to really an unnatural state of playing preparation, which they themselves probably don't completely understand because it's using these lines, these computer lines, which are oftentimes not really fit to the human imagination. And one thing about this particular line that um, I think we're, we're, we're going to see is that um, the computer will oftentimes have a hard time appreciating just how dangerous the white attack can be. So the computer alone won't solve your problems in a game like this. You need to have some kind of experience along with it. And that's why Topolov is particularly dangerous, I think, in a variation like this. So I expect we'll see this variation again and no reason for Anon to fear the variation in general. And I have to report right now, of course, that it's very encouraging to see that Anon, at this point of the state of the recording, won game two, and so wasn't completely psychologically destroyed by this humiliating defeat. Many other players, myself included, would have had a much harder time psychologically coming back from such a humiliating loss, which is really, in World Championship history, one of the most stunning first-round games that we've seen. So this is GM Jesse Cry, hoping you enjoyed the lecture. Bye-bye.